Hello and welcome to the Docker Frontier webinar, APAC's Healthcare Landscape, What to Expect from COVID-19. I'm Sarah Gunnis, Managing Director of Client Services here out here in Asia Pacific. Before we get started, we realize that some of you may be new to Docker Frontier, so we'd like to take a minute to provide you with a very quick overview of our firm and how we work with executives at major multinationals. Uh, Ducker Frontier is a leading market intelligence and consulting firm that provides tailored solutions to drive growth for clients across the consumer, B2B, healthcare, and technology sectors. Our dedicated teams serve as advisors to clients delivering market and industry knowledge they need to succeed in all points of the business cycle. With continuous research and insights, custom solutions, and transaction support services, we provide our clients, a small sample of which you can see here, with timely, actionable insights to adapt to, a win to winning in changing markets. Uh, our company is headquartered in Washington, D.C., with offices in Troy, Michigan, New York, London, Paris, Berlin, of course, here in Singapore, Shanghai, and Bangalore. For more information, please visit www.duckerfrontier.com. Having uh, briefly introduced our company, I'd like to take a, mo a moment to briefly introduce our panelists today. We have two members from our research team on the line for today's call. Uh, the first is Adam Jarzik. He leads the research team for Asia Pacific at Decker Frontier and will be sharing insights on the macroeconomic view for Asia Pacific and several key markets across the region. The second is Alec Lee. He is our practice leader for our global healthcare research team and will be explaining how macro shifts are impacting health, healthcare ecosystems in Asia and how COVID is impacting the digital stakeholder engagement. Uh, because Adam and Alec are in constant contact with our clients, they will be discussing not only the results of our research, but also what we've been hearing from multinationals who are being impacted by the coronavirus. If there are any insights you see today as part of this discussion or any questions we don't get to answer, our client services team, Ravin, Althea, Yu Chen, and I will be happy to follow up with you directly. Uh, to give you a better sense of how we intend to do that, I'd like to turn things now over to Adam to take us through the agenda. Thanks, Sarah. In terms of our agenda today, we'll begin the session with a discussion on the outlook for Asia Pacific in 2020. During that portion of the presentation, we'll outline our high-level view for the global economy and the COVID outbreak in Asia, as well as the assumptions underpinning our forecasts across markets. Once we've finished sharing the regional outlook, we'll dig deeper into our healthcare research with a discussion on the impacts of COVID-19 on local healthcare ecosystems. During that portion of the presentation, we'll survey individual markets across Asia, China, Japan, Korea, India, ASEAN, and explain how major macroeconomic shifts are going to impact healthcare spending and shape policymaking priorities. We'll then round out the session with a discussion on the impacts of COVID-19 on digital stakeholder engagement. During that section, we'll examine the prospects for digital engagement in the post-COVID environment Specifically, we'll touch on how healthcare companies are adjusting their digital marketing and digital solutions to enhance their outreach. Now, clearly, that's a lot to get through. So, without further ado, let's get started with the outlook for Asia Pacific in 2020. Now, we can't talk about the outlook for Asia Pacific without first talking about the broader global environment. We are facing a global recession this year. Major markets around the world are falling into contractionary territory, and this will have significant implications for APAC. You can see that if you look at the chart on your screen. Uh, we've compared their uh, forecasts from six months ago to forecasts today uh, for economic growth in major regions around the world. Uh, you'll see that our forecasts from six months ago, our November 2019 vintage, if you will, which are outlined in blue, have dropped dramatically uh, to the levels that are outlined by the maroon bars. You see that in particular, North America and Western Europe have dropped heavily into contractionary territory. And so in, in this environment, even if you were to escape a major domestic outbreak, there would really be no escaping from the ripple effects. And so it should be no surprise to see that growth forecasts have collapsed across developed and emerging Asia this year, upending uh, regional executives growth forecasts, revenue generation forecasts. Last year, every major market in Asia was an expansionary territory. Now, four large markets, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, Thailand, 
are projected to contract this year, and other large stalwarts like China, India, and Indonesia are projected to barely grow and may end up flirting with contraction. Regrettably, the risk on all these forecasts tilts towards the downside because Asia is in the middle of a second wave of COVID-19. What you see on the chart in front of you are active COVID-19 cases mapped out by country. What do we say, or what do we mean when we say active cases? Uh, basically, that's the total number of cases in a country minus the number of people who have recovered, minus the number of people who have passed away. Now, there's a lot going on in this chart, so let me break it down. There are two things here for you to note. The first is the shape of the curve. The second is the composition of the curve. In terms of the shape of the curve, what you'll note is that uh, we're not just in the middle of a second wave, but that second wave has already surpassed the first one in size. In terms of the composition of the curve, what you'll note is that this was originally, as you all know, a China outbreak. And you see that by the fact that the first wave is just blue. The second wave is multicolored, indicating that the epidemic in China is spread out across the rest of the region. This has become a much more complex issue. Now, the natural question that arises is, or from, from this analysis is, when will this wave crest? And unfortunately, we can't make a confident prediction at this point because the markets that are currently building the wave are all undercounting and do not show clear signs of peaking. Specifically here, I would point to India and Indonesia. Although one could argue, particularly given the undercounting that's happening globally, that uh, the likes of Japan uh, could be included as well. Now, this makes planning incredibly difficult. After all, in this environment, the single most important question we face for planning is timelines. Because we can't yet make confident predictions based on data, we basically have to make a series of clear assumptions. You can see from our side what those look like if you look at the bottom of the slide. What we've outlined there are epidemiological assumptions as well as economic assumptions that are impacting the region as a whole. <clears throat> In terms of our epidemiological assumptions, we've made two. The first is that COVID will be affected by seasons. There's some evidence to indicate uh, that uh, the, the virus does not do as well in warmer, more humid temperatures. But that evidence is not yet sufficient for us to assert that as a given. So we are making that assumption. Secondly, we're assuming that COVID will act like SARS. That is, it will peak once and then come back down and it will not rebound or boomerang around the globe as did the Spanish flu of 1918 to 19. We've also made some economic assumptions. Uh, externally, we've made assumptions about the U.S. and the EU, namely that both will experience U-shaped recoveries. That is, they will not bounce back quickly from this blow. And we've also noted here that, uh, for reasons we'll get into in a bit, we expect an extended V-shaped recovery in China. All of this wraps up to the timeline, which you should see in the middle of the slide, uh, basically outlining. Uh, when different parts of Asia and the world economy uh, will see production and consumption freezes, as well as a gradual return to normal activity. Of course, this timeline will vary by industry and by segment, uh, but by and large, we found that our assumptions match those of the clients whom we serve. Uh, we've seen this time and time again in polls that we've run, not just here in Asia Pacific, but globally. And with those assumptions in mind, uh, we're able to construct a unified view of our expectations for Asia. Uh, here's how I would sum it up. With the exception of China, where as noted, we expect an extended V-shaped recovery, we expect a generally U-shaped recovery across the Asia-Pacific region. Basically, we expect growth around Asia to be pulled down by domestic outbreaks and external weakness in Q2 before gradually recovering and being pulled up by China starting in Q3. And what that means is growth is going to take time to recover across the board. Now, in some places like Japan and Thailand, the U will be deeper than in others, like Vietnam and Korea. Uh, 
Now, having laid out our high-level view for the global economy and the COVID outbreak in Asia, as well as the assumptions underpinning our forecasts across markets, let's move to speaking about how companies and individual markets are transitioning to a post-COVID-19 healthcare landscape. Over to you, Alec. Excellent. Thanks, Adam. Um, if we go to the next page, what I want to do to begin is lay out some of the questions we're going to try to answer uh, today. So if we think about this situation, not only in Asia, but globally, we see a lot of the same impacts across healthcare systems, but each of those healthcare systems are obviously unique and are going to react differently to the progress of the virus uh, in the local condition. So the questions that we're going to be looking at answering today are essentially the following. The first and foremost is really around financing. So specifically, what's going to be the impact on funding for healthcare across your Asia markets in the short term, so the rest of 2020, but also looking into 2021 and 2022? And one of the key questions I want to dive into specifically is the impact on the financing or the financial situation of private providers as those private providers are some of the most financially vulnerable with foregone uh, procedures that they're not generating revenue with and if they're not sustained that could largely impact the medium-term sustainability of local uh, healthcare systems the other key question that we have here that i'm going to focus on today is going to be specifically around not just what are the risks, but what are the opportunities? So you'll see a couple of key questions here, one of which is how strongly will governments pursue digital health initiatives? I know we've all heard about uh, one government or another uh, implementing telehealth in different ways, but what comes next? What are the opportunities and how do uh, companies need to think about those opportunities in order to drive differentiation, which is the key here? and effectively impact commercial revenues. Um, and then finally, of course, what is going to be the, the other reactions from governments in terms of uh, access and reimbursement policies that go beyond funding? So to think about these questions, I wanna propose a framework to begin with. And so on the next page, what we will see is essentially how we're thinking about uh, four key questions in the short, medium, and long term, given the current uh, COVID uh, impact. So we have four questions here, one around demand planning, so uh, anticipation for demand for, uh, around different therapeutic areas, engagement model, how companies are having to engage their external stakeholders, the impact of supply chains, both locally, but also in a global picture, and then finally, strategic planning. So thinking about the prioritization of markets, prioritization of uh, therapeutic areas, uh, and even in some cases, uh, considering R&D, not only in terms of new therapies, but also in terms of new integrated services, whether for uh, pharmaceutical companies or med tech. So I know most of you uh, are living this moment, obviously, right now, and the short term has become pretty clear for us, even though I have to mention and make it clear that as Adam has laid out, we're still not 100% clear uh, if uh, and how strong uh, there will be a second wave of infections in many of our markets. That said, what I'm gonna focus on today is that medium and long-term. So what happens in the second half of 2020 into 2021 and then beyond? And again, the key questions I'll highlight again here that I wanna focus on today are going to be is specifically, uh, what can we anticipate in terms of the return of elective procedures, not only elective procedures, but any sort of elective activity within the healthcare system? So I'm thinking diagnostic around chronic diseases, uh, continued treatment even for some chronic diseases, which uh, before wouldn't be considered elective, but some patients have made them just that during this crisis. Second, the persistent financial pressures on private providers. I've already explained that a little, but again, I want to highlight this as being absolutely critical for understanding the uh, continued development of these markets. And then finally, in the medium term uh, column here, I'm going to be focusing on specifically uh, the question around how the, what will be the impact on uh, the buildup of potential, let's call them, stockpiles uh, of uh, medicines, medical devices, consumables 
in the short term by these governments will, and how that impact uh, demand expectations across the rest of 2020. And then finally, in the long term, the key questions today as we go deeply into each market, uh, I'm going to highlight one, even though I'll go a little bit uh, broader when we go into each market. But I think the, the one that I'd like to highlight here specifically is going to be around rising fiscal pressures. So exactly how will each government address the rising fiscal pressures as they're being demanded to spend more and more on healthcare services? And I think what we'll see come out very clearly is that the anticipation of a potential second wave, but also what each government was doing prior to the COVID-19 crisis will have direct implications on how they're able to address those fiscal pressures. Excellent. So moving forward, I wanted to highlight one more item before we start to looking at each market in turn. That's going to be that while we're all facing across our markets it, the same issue, uh, a global pandemic, um, we are facing that global pandemic, let's say, in different phases at different times in different intensity. But we also have to consider that each healthcare market is very distinct and it's very distinct the way we analyze it from a, a financial flows perspective, uh, where the money comes from, how that money's uh, funneled to particular public and private providers. And it's going to have a deep impact on answering the questions that I've posed here today. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is pass the word back over to Adam to take us into a deeper macroeconomic view, first of all, of China, so we can explore more deeply what the impact will be there in both the rest of 2020 and 2021. Brilliant, thank you, Alec. There's so much we could talk about with regards to China, but our time is limited. Uh, so let me try to boil down our view for the macro environment. China took a huge hit from the COVID outbreak in Q1 due to the domestic outbreak and subsequent crackdown. You can see this in the chart in Q1. Basically there we've laid out our growth forecasts uh, by quarter, these are annual growth, or year on year growth uh, for each of the cores of China, uh, comparing what we thought in January versus February versus the beginning of March versus the end of March versus now. Uh, what you see is that Q1 came down uh, dramatically. Uh, not too surprising given what we saw take place there. Um, and initially we thought that there'd be a, a rapid bounce back, but regrettably the climb back to growth for China has been slower uh, than we and many others had hoped for due to slowdowns in China's major export markets like the US and the EU, uh, which is why you can see uh, growth forecasts for Q2 and Q3 in particular uh, coming down quite substantially. Now, uh, you wouldn't know that China is facing a very uh, difficult climb out of uh, the, the Q1 dip from listening to the official story in China. According to the country's leaders, China's back to work and they have statistics to demonstrate it. But it's important to take their narrative and statistics with a hefty helping of salt. Um, these factors are uh, political, inherently political, and do not align with uh, what we're hearing from companies on the ground. To, to give you a sense of the difference, uh, Chinese leaders say that work uh, at the beginning of this uh, month or the first week or two of this month, Chinese leaders were saying that work had normalized uh, between 77 and 99 percent, uh, depending on whether you're talking about small, medium-sized enterprises or SOEs. Um, our clients, on the other hand, estimated that that number was less than 60 percent. Um, so there's there's a pretty big differential in terms of the the narrative. Uh, that we're hearing from the top and the reality on the ground. Now, with that said, uh, we do believe that China will recover faster than other markets, not only because it encountered and curbed the virus sooner, but also because we expect the Chinese government to boost economic growth with stimulus. And while the exact form of the sti stimulus isn't yet clear, officials have indicated that money will flow to projects, which should include hospital infrastructure, and to uh, households directly, which should bolster incomes and ideally out-of-pocket spending as well. We also just got some insight into timelines for the stimulus packages announcement. Uh, basically, the government needs to hold a major meeting called the uh, Liang Hui, uh, the two sessions meeting before it can roll out stimulus. That was just scheduled uh, to begin on May 22nd. Uh, so that's 
that's the time to watch for uh, details coming out of the Chinese government uh, about the stimulus package. Now, all of this will, of course, have substantive implications for China's healthcare environment. So I'm going to pass things now over to Alec to share more details. Excellent. A uh, very robust view on the, the macro situation in a market that I think, uh, you know, if we're thinking about Asia and, and thinking globally and thinking about our uh, global and regional portfolios is definitely in a very unique situation in that it was obviously the first to get hit by the pandemic. And as you demonstrated earlier, um, it's also a, basically your only market globally. It will not be only, but only major market globally. Uh, that's not necessarily still in the battle or facing a second wave. Um, that said, uh, when we think about the short-term uh, impact on the healthcare sector in China, and obviously we could spend literally all day talking about this subject, um, but in summary, what we're seeing is a short-term need to Increased spending, yes, which we do believe is coming, especially if we're thinking not only in terms of government spending uh, in order to maintain the current level of uh, spending as a percentage of GDP and provide continued access, uh, not only uh, to primary care, but also to innovation, but also to the uh, stimulus to private consumption and the impact that that will have on out-of-pocket spending over the second half of the year. But if we think about the priorities in the short term, what we're seeing is a situation where the government will, A, need to invest heavily in access to primary care in the first moment in anticipation, essentially, of a potential second wave of infection. So that's to say that despite China's not facing that second wave right now, uh, local healthcare actors are going to have to behave as if that is a a possibility, effectively forcing them into diverting increased funding in the short term into primary care, as well as training for general practitioners and potentially even expanding access or physical infrastructure in some tier two and tier three cities. Second, in the short term, uh, we also see a situation where some of the additional funding is going to have to be diverted, as I mentioned before, into stockpiling of certain products also in anticipation of a potential second wave of infection. Now, when we look at the overall situation, we've also seen in China, obviously, the implementation or a broadening of the telehealth and digital health solutions. We see over the next six months that while you'll, you will see some patients, physicians, both specialists as well as general practitioners return to past behaviors, we do think that this has created an opportunity in the short term for a broadening of the application of those solutions. So, and we'll talk about that in the last component of today's session when we look at actually digital stakeholder engagement uh, more broadly. But the fourth point I wanted to raise here in the short term before moving to the medium and long term implications is specifically that beyond the a small increase in spending over the next six months that will largely go to addressing some of these issues and the potential uh, buildup and uh, protection against a potential second wave of infections, we also see a situation, a risk, where companies should be considering how a, the economic impact might drive a payment delays or even defaults from some uh, provinces that have been directly exposed to the manufacturing crisis driven by both the local economic impact as well as the global economic impact. Um, that's to say that while we are positive on this market and where it's headed both from a public and private uh, expenditure uh, perspective, there are definitely short-term uh, risks that uh, potentially have not come fully to fruition that we should be paying attention to. Now, that said, we do believe that the most interesting insights and potential it will come in 2021 and beyond. So when we think about uh, what China was doing prior to the crisis, and you'll see a general theme throughout this uh, discussion today, essentially that many of the trends we were witnessing across Asia uh, in the healthcare markets prior to the COVID-19 crisis, we're actually anticipating many of those to continue beyond the COVID-19 crisis. And so if I were to summarize what the Chinese government was attempting to do, in turn, it would be 
reducing out-of-pocket spending while improving access to innovation. I know I've majorly simplified this, but again, uh, we have a limited uh, amount of time today and we could be talking about this literally all day. So to that point, what we see occurring really over the next 12 to 24 months is a doubling down of what we are already seeing occurring prior to this crisis. And that includes uh, A, the uh, pursuit of a unified reimbursement scheme. Uh, so combining uh, national and provincial uh, reimbursement lists. Uh, B, uh, the continued uh, centralization of procurement, especially to reduce uh, spending on, uh, uh, on, excuse me, on, uh, branded generics and, and other uh, non-patented uh, uh, products. Third, uh, or C, uh, the pursuit of alternative payment models uh, in hospitals across the country. Um, and then finally, uh, the pursuit of the expansion of private insurance and also the expansion of digital healthcare solutions locally, especially with the investment into 5G. Now, that said, we believe that the biggest opportunities for companies in China over that period are going to be uh, specifically around uh, when we're thinking about uh, it, these changes. First of all, and most clearly, where most companies are already investing in the engagement around the uh, digital strategy of the government, which is going to have to double down on in the short term in order to reduce costs at the same time as expanding access and looking to improve quality. Second, it, the expansion of infrastructure in tier three and tier two cities um, and the continued investment in primary care. Uh, and then finally, the uh, what we I would call a breakneck pace of expansion of private insurance that we don't expect to let up anytime soon. Now, that's all to say uh, there are still risk on the table, of course. Um, pricing pressures will not go away. And finally, uh, I think Adam would highlight this is there is a continued risk of seeing a delay or cancellation even of the recent uh, agreement between the U.S. and China, which would have and will, uh, as of now at least, provide enhanced IP protection for pharmaceuticals locally. So uh, summarizing again, in the short term, I think we're going to see a divergence of some attention to what would happen if we saw a second wave, at least from the local stakeholders. Uh, but in the, the medium and long term, really a divergence back to the trends that we were seeing even uh, prior to the crisis. Um, so overall, I would call us bullish on China. Um, and I hope this is a positive sentiment because as we move forward to look at our other markets uh, today, I think you'll see that uh, our sentiment begins to shift more towards the negative side. Yeah. So maybe we, with that, we can we can begin that shift uh, by speaking a little bit about uh, Japan. Uh, from the macro side, our view on Japan is, is quite clear. COVID-19 is driving the economy further uh, into recession. I say further because Japan's economy was already on the brink of recession coming into this year. The Abe administration's consumption tax hike last year dealt the economy a serious blow and left it with a hangover in Q1. Uh, which only intensified the impact of the COVID outbreak and subsequent lockdown, as well as the delay in the Tokyo Olympics. The bottom line here is the economy will remain in contraction for most of the year, uh, as you can see on in this uh, chart on the right-hand side of the slide. And we do not expect to see a solid recovery in Japan, despite the fact that the government is implementing an absolutely massive uh, stimulus package. So with this in mind, expect substantial pressures on healthcare spending and on government pricing policies, and not just because the economy is, is slowed down quite dramatically, the economy's in contraction, uh, but also because of the absolutely massive amounts of money that the Japanese government is pumping into the economy uh, in order to achieve even the numbers uh, that you see on this slide. Alec will share a little more detail on what uh, those macroeconomic factors mean in the healthcare context. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you, Adam. So 
Again, going back to where we stood before the COVID-19 crisis, because I think this is absolutely fundamental for having a forward-looking view of what comes next, we are obviously seeing a government, uh, as Adam mentioned, that was uh, looking to the future and looking for answers to how can you promote innovation at the same time that you're looking to drive cost reduction. So we know that in 2019, for example, uh, we had the, the introduction of an HTA uh, into pricing decisions locally, looking at cost-benefit analysis, uh, attempting to, to drive uh, enhanced innovation adoption um, in the market and provide access to an aging population to, uh, to innovation more quickly. Um, but at the same time, as we approached 2020, we were seeing policies uh, such as enhanced uh, social security spending specifically on items that would in the medium and long term decrease spending um, on chronic care. So here I'm talking about uh, additional spending on preventive care as well as uh, additional spending on changing uh, the way that uh, the workforce, the healthcare workforce was uh, going about uh, their jobs is effectively looking to drive in both instances uh, productivity gains in order to face that uh, coming demographic shift that you'll see uh, with mass retirements around the corner. That said, coming into the situation, we also had two more reforms that were on the table. Uh, well, two that were, uh, I'm going to highlight today, many more, of course, uh, underlying these uh, major two items. The first one was going to be uh, effectively an increase in the uh, co-payments paid by the elderly, um, increasing up from 10% uh, in order to, to continue to finance this system as we saw a, an increasing uh, retired population. Uh, the second and, and critical item uh, as we move forward was going to be around looking at uh, increasing uh, deductibles for uh, outpatient procedures. Now, both of these items, again, were addressing a dire financial situation as we look at the long-term evolution of this healthcare system. And obviously, as Adam has laid out, uh, we might have a, a significant round two of infections coming for Japan uh, in which they would have to shut down more of the economy. Um, and this is a market that uh, whose hospitals rely on fee-for-service uh, in many cases, uh, financing, and uh, that has not addressed the potential hazards that that uh, confronts for the private providers in the market. So that's to say that I don't think we're completely out of the weeds here yet, nor have we potentially even felt the full impact of the financial blow to this healthcare system at the same time that it was much more financially debilitated than China. So what does that mean that we might see coming around the corner when we look at 2021 and 2022? Uh, if we go to the next page, I wanted to highlight uh, effectively um, that we're going to see a situation that uh, the government will not be able to avoid it pursuing these reforms that I mentioned before that it already had on the table for 2020 specifically and clearly uh, pushing more of the cost burden onto the patient through increased co-payments and increased deductibles for certain procedures. That said, the biggest risk, and I don't think this is going to be escapable, is that we are very likely to see under these conditions uh, in which we're seeing a falling economy, um, a falling uh, social security uh, revenues, as well as a potential, uh, the potential that we haven't even seen the full impact on this healthcare system from a financial perspective, is that in all likelihood, we're going to see an increase in arbitrary decisions around pricing, potentially more one-off measures in terms of price reductions, also potential increases in exclusions from the local formulary. And then finally, and one of my biggest concerns is potential reversals in terms of the decisions around uh, the role of the HTA in uh, deciding on pricing and new inclusions uh, into uh, what's reimbursed locally. Um, so that's to say, again, uh, I mentioned as we transition from China into Japan that we were moving from one uh, market which we we're bullish to one market in which the outlook has become dimmer. Um, and I would also mention that uh, we do see at the beginning of a reversal potentially of some of the trends uh, 
here that we had seen before, which again, Japan was looking to balance riding the fiscal situation at the same time that it was providing access to innovation. Um, and I think that the, the biggest uh, uh, salve that we might have here is that uh, the Japanese pharmaceutical industry will continue to want access uh, to markets abroad. And that will put some pressure on the government to continue to uh, attempt to uh, provide uh, reimbursement for innovation locally, but the financials right now aren't looking very positive uh, for this market, especially over the next 24 months. Very good. Well, moving from one East Asian economy to another, let's go ahead and, and take a look at South Korea. Um, now, you could be deceived. Uh, for believing that the two are facing a very similar situation in many ways. Um, South Korea is going through a recession just like Japan is. And that's despite the fact that uh, the, Koreans, uh, the Korean government's response to COVID-19 is, is quite strong. Uh, some might argue uh, best in class, uh, particularly for a large developed democracy. Um, the the different there are some differences though uh, which we'll, we'll get into in a bit um, with that being said uh, let me just outline some of the macro factors at play uh, the outbreak of covid both domestically and internationally has not been kind to korea uh, it has yielded collapsing exports uh, decline in private investment uh, muted consumer confidence muted demand um, you can see that reflected in the first two quarters of growth. Uh, once again, Korea, much like Japan, uh, experiencing a pretty substantial uh, contraction. But you also notice uh, that we expect to see a relatively rapid rebound in Korea uh, during the second half of the year. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. The first, the fact that we do believe that South Korea will continue to exhibit an effective COVID-19 response and therefore uh, get their economy back on track more quickly than most. Um, also though, uh, massive fiscal stimulus, 12.5% uh, of GDP. Admittedly not as large as Japan's, not as large as some Southeast Asian markets, but targeted fiscal stimulus uh, that will be key to avoiding a total bottoming out of out-of-pocket spending, hospital finances, uh, private insurance spending, um, the, the Mood administration is, is really moved to uh, implement effective uh, targeted stimulus measures, uh, which should help Korea to recover, um, particularly in the back of more robust Chinese growth. Um, so that's, that's our broad view for the South Korean macro environment. Uh, Alec will share a little bit more on our view for the healthcare space specifically. Excellent. So I think we're a little bit more positive here than the, the case of Japan, but there are still significant financial headwinds to be faced. So if we look even before this uh, crisis, uh, we were seeing a government that was uh, attempting to uh, increase um, uh, effective uh, coverage rates for the national health insurance um, by uh, planning to inject significant uh, funding into the system uh, over the next uh, two years. Um, however, at the same time that that was happening, we uh, were confronting a situation where reimbursement rates for hospitals remained uh, fairly uh, low, uh, putting financial pressure uh, on the, the private institutions. And at the, the, the same, uh, in a parallel instance, um, we saw a situation where it was becoming increasingly difficult for the government to increase premiums in order to finance that increased spending. Um, uh, upon facing this situation that Adam has laid out, uh, obviously this has created a, a, a significant challenge. Um, and uh, really on the negative side, uh, we see a situation where the government, part of the, the financial package has been to provide tax breaks um, that will directly impact the revenue intake of the national health insurance. Uh, therefore, putting into question that continued expansion in spending in order to re uh, increase uh, the coverage rates and provide a better access uh, to the broader population. 
Um, and really the only way of addressing that situation in the short term will be for the government to directly increase its own contributions from the general government taxation uh, into the healthcare system, which we do anticipate it will do, uh, but at the same time, it's unlikely it will do so without pursuing additional cost reduction uh, measures, um, both around price as well as by reducing quality. Now, uh, at the same time, there's been some positives uh, in, the, in the, let's say, reaction. As Adam mentioned, they, we've seen a fairly strong, robust reaction here. One of the biggest positives has been direct cash injections into the private providers. Uh, we have seen uh, countries around the world do this. However, I would uh, highlight that uh, it, it still remains uh, the exception and not the norm for governments to directly have already directly supported their private providers to ensure that they remain financially viable. Um, and then the second, of course, is the temporary expansion of uh, telemedicine, which, uh, uh, as uh, we've all thought through this, could significantly uh, expand access. Uh, diagnostics as well as access to uh, primary care uh, even following this crisis. Now, if we move to the medium and long-term uh, outcomes, uh, really what we're looking at is a situation, again, very clearly, uh, in order to continue to uh, increase the financing that was anticipated prior to the crisis, the government will need to um, significantly enhance its own direct contributions. Um, from general taxation, which of course will have been impacted by the economic uh, crisis that has been felt across 2020. Um, but at the same time, we see many opportunities. Uh, opportunities uh, around it expanded potential use of uh, PPPs uh, to uh, facilitate access um, and expansion of infrastructure. Um, opportunities around the new uh, engagement models when it comes to contracting, innovative contracting around the price volume uh, contracts with this government. Um, and then finally, uh, of course, um, there will be risk to the downside. And specifically here, I would highlight two. Um, and as I mentioned, as the government has to increase its own allocations for financing, it will want to reduce cost. And, and specifically, these two risks that I highlight would be the acceleration of delistings from the formulary, as well as uh, the potential uh, to see a, a favoritism towards um, local manufacturers, which of course uh, you do have significant uh, uh, investment locally in terms of uh, diagnostics, med tech, uh, but also um, a growing uh, local pharmaceutical uh, 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 group. So. I want to stop here. Again, um, there's a lot more we could talk about. This is a highlight of the impacts and the key takeaways um, in short and the medium term, but I want to pause and, and let Adam continue to look at India before we finish with the ASEAN markets tonight and provide ourselves time to speak a little bit about the, the digital story that we've been seeing as a, a common theme across these markets. Yeah, sounds, sounds great, Alec. Um, so India, briefly is in an incredibly difficult position no matter how you slice it. The country came into this year in the throes of a slow-moving financial crisis. Uh, its banks were in disarray and the government's efforts were not that helpful in alleviating the situation. And now, uh, domestic COVID epidemic is sweeping across India leading to lockdowns, massive downside risk for the economy. Uh, risk that's probably larger than that faced by any other major market in Asia Pacific. I say that because India, unlike others, uh, lacks the resources to offset the epide epidemic's impact uh, with stimulus. I mean, take a look at the chart on the right-hand side of this slide. Uh, you'll see the size of India's stimulus relative to many other markets around Asia. Uh, it's, it's shockingly small. And to a large degree, it's because India doesn't have the financial wherewithal to make it uh, dramatically bigger. Um, that's why, or, that is fundamentally the reason why, if, if you look at the chart on the left-hand side, um, where we've mapped out uh, a growth forecast for a base case and potential downside scenario, uh, the downside scenario is so dire for India. Ultimately, India's growth trajectory will depend on the severity of its domestic outbreak, uh, which at this point uh, is incredibly difficult to predict. Now, we don't want to spend too much time focusing on the downside here, 
because even the base case uh, is, is pretty devastating and will have serious implications uh, for the healthcare space. So I'll turn things over to Alec uh, to speak about that in a little bit more depth. Excellent. So again, starting with where we were before this crisis, just moving into 2020, I think the first thing I'd highlight is, despite the fact that uh, India had been implementing a massive, or what it would call the massive uh, a public investment in healthcare in order to essentially shift the market away from a, a out-of-pocket model, uh, we anticipated, or the, the actual uh, central government budget for healthcare in 2020 was only going to grow by about 4%, essentially meaning that uh, healthcare expenditure was going to grow slower than the estimated GDP growth, uh, and that was at the beginning of the year. So contracting public health expenditure in the middle of a, a massive uh, so-called expansion of uh, public health spending was going to contract as a percentage of GDP, and that was before uh this crisis um obviously it, within that context a part of the the investment uh, had been shifted towards primary care but in fact in 2020 was slated towards uh building out tertiary care a uh, hospital infrastructure um especially in tier tier two tier three cities and in rural areas um now when we look at the situation the impact obviously much of this uh, spending needs to be shifted but the biggest short-term impact is going to be on that out-of-pocket spending india unlike the other markets we've talked about here china uh more to it to an extent china um but japan and, and south korea and south korea even has a, a significant amount of out-of-pocket spending but nowhere near the extent of india um, India is in a very unique situation here and will be massively impacted, not just in the short term, uh, by the economic contraction and with the consumers obviously having stockpiled uh, medicines. Uh, but moving forward, uh, we need to think through what will be the impact uh, stemming from the fact that, uh, A, those consumers will have less disposable income. They'll have already stockpiled many uh, medicines, uh, consumables, etc. Um, but B, they'll then look to shift their demand uh, because they, they don't have a job, they don't have as much income as they did before, they'll shift their demand to a public system uh, that was already underfunded for 2020 and with a government that's under increasing financial pressure. Uh, and that just leads to increased uh, pricing pressures in 2020, but also moving forward into 2021. So if we think about that impact moving into 2021, obviously, uh, India is notorious for uh, the experimentation with price controls. We were seeing a situation in which India and the U.S. were moving closer towards a trade deal, which would have uh, potentially changed some of the implications for those controls. Um, and uh, now there's large questions about uh, if we could see a reacceleration and more uh, arbitrary policy making when it comes to uh, a, a trade margin controls in terms of both. Uh, med tech as well as pharma. Um, and the optimism even before the crisis that you would see a significant expansion of the local formula in 2020 and potentially 2021, I think that we even need to reconsider those assumptions as well. Um, again, I think that uh, we made it very clear we were going to move from a bullish market to China into more pessimistic territory. Um, but uh, within the, the group of three countries, because of the, the heavy reliance, or excuse me, the four countries we've talked about here, Given the heavy reliance on out-of-pocket spending of India, um, we're most likely the uh, most pessimistic when it comes to this market, at least in the next six to 12 months. Very good. Well, we'll wrap up the, uh, the, the country or the, the regional uh, portion of this webinar with a brief discussion in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's it's difficult to make generalizations about Southeast Asia. The region is incredibly diverse, um, but there is one area where we expect to see consistency across the board, and that is in the shape of the slowdown. We expect Southeast Asian countries uh, to face the largest slowdowns uh, in Q2 relative to other quarters. Uh, what you see mapped out on the slide is, is just that, economic growth uh, year on year, uh, across the four quarters of this year for the major uh, emerging markets of Southeast Asia. And you see there's a dip in Q2 for every single one of them. Um, 
The, the shape of that curve varies a little bit. Uh, you'll note that uh, for every market except for Indonesia, uh, Q4 numbers are, are higher than Q1. Uh, in Indonesia, we expect the recovery to take a bit longer than elsewhere because of its uh, substantial outbreak and less than robust response. Um, but basically, the bottom line here is that executives should uh, prepare uh, for an increase in demand in the second half of this year in Southeast Asia writ large uh, relative to the first half of this year. Um, of course, uh, these recoveries are not just going to happen uh, on their own. In several cases, governments are going to have to get involved to spur recovery, uh, and that will, of course, have implications for healthcare companies. Um, but by and large, the shape is quite clear. So I'll turn it over to Alec now to uh, talk through some of the implications. Excellent. So I think I'm, I'm going to be brief here and likely use this one page to, to talk about the, your ASEAN markets uh, for, for today. Um, and I think the key takeaway again is when we look at these markets, uh, you obviously see a very low um, expenditure uh, in terms of uh, percentage of GDP from coming from public, uh, uh, the public side. Um, and when we think about the reaction to this crisis, again, the dynamic tends to be across markets, um, a negative impact on consumer purchasing power, a, a first uh, increase in expenditure from consumers at the same time that they're seeing that negative impact um, on a medicines, a painkillers, other medicines to directly uh, treat uh, potential symptoms from uh, COVID-19 or even stocking up on their uh, their prescriptions for chronic uh, conditions. Um, and when we come out in the, the six-month period afterwards, you'll still see weak, uh, uh, weak um, incomes and you'll have spent uh, that money uh, in the short term. So we're really looking at a situation where the governments do have significant fiscal space when compared to other markets to increase uh, public spending on healthcare, um, but typically speaking, um, when we see this happen, it, it, it's not something that's going to occur overnight necessarily. Um, and so I think the biggest risk that I would highlight here um, is going to be that uh, as out-of-pocket spending comes under pressure in the short term, uh, I would not uh, negate to seeing some of the policies that we've seen in your uh, developed uh, Asia markets or, or larger Asia markets around addressing uh, costs if, to consumers of healthcare out of pocket to reduce out of pocket costs, specifically looking at price controls, uh, uh, items to diversify uh, uh, competition within the retail pharmaceutical space, uh, et cetera to be applied in some of these markets as they rebound from the crisis and they begin to feel, a, a, let's say, a cries from consumers uh, that are feeling pressure on out-of-pocket spending. At the same time, there's obviously a very large upside from the public uh, expenditure side. If there's ever a time in which we're going to see the markets globally that have not spent, uh, have not even come close to the 6% of GDP that the World Health Organization suggests that countries spend, um, in terms of public spending on, on healthcare, um, this is the moment. And I think that this is a really great opportunity to engage locally um, and try to drive uh, the correct narrative around specific uh, therapeutic areas um, and guide policymakers as they look to build out that capacity. That said, what I'd like to do for the rest of this uh, session is go ahead and dive into the digital stakeholder engagement, because I know it's a, a large topic um, for all of us. Uh, so when we look at the situation, and even before the crisis, uh, what I want to bring to the table is specifically, uh, we were already in the midst of a transition to digital stakeholder engagement, both with pharma, med tech, and, I, and, uh, and diagnostics. Um, however, right now it was really a forced, a more rapid shift into uh, engaging stakeholders digitally and then wondering what comes next. Uh, and that's opened up some big questions. So uh, today what I want to do is lay out exactly what we think that uh, companies will need to address. What are the big uh, 
three questions and issues companies will need to address. So they're they're ensuring that they're actually driving uh, differentiation in terms of engagement with these investments. So uh, if we go to the next page, what we're essentially going to see, and let's go forward one more, um, is going to be a, a framework for how we think about digital uh, uh, transformation within the healthcare sector. So uh, usually when we're talking with the teams globally, what we end up seeing is that there's a lot of confusion around what is digital. So we've broken up to three buckets. The first one being processes. So thinking about here about digital clinical trials, people management, so HR, and then finally stakeholder engagement, which we effectively break down into two buckets. The first one being digital marketing and the second one digital solutions. So here to be very clear with the, the group listening in uh, today, um, I'm specifically talking about a uh, digital marketing in this first component. So creating awareness, influencing and advocating. Now, even before the crisis, I said a lot of companies were shifting budgets into this area. And we'd actually done a benchmarking to look specifically at that issue. So going to the next page, what we'll see is that even before the crisis, we were seeing that companies within the healthcare space globally were anticipating shifting a significant portion of their marketing budget into digital marketing. However, of course, there were certain holdups, especially in your large markets to do so. Why would you change what was already working? So we were actually seeing this happening faster in smaller, less critical markets than your large market, your large globally important markets for revenue, such as China, Japan, South Korea, Russia, Brazil, the United States, Western Europe, et cetera. Now, within that context, some of the biggest challenges specifically in terms of uh, making sure that this was being effective was uh, making, uh, helping to create content that was differentiated enough to engage uh, with your uh, uh, clinicians. And second, that uh, the clinicians were already receiving too much content, so too much engagement at times. They were feeling overwhelmed. And companies were saying that they were already confronting these issues even prior to the crisis. So if we think about the current situation where suddenly everyone's engaging digitally, um, I, I saw another study uh, even today where 100% of respondents in Asia had said that they uh, were shifting to a full uh, digital engagement model. Uh, uh, no surprise, of course, as we can't uh, be in person with our external stakeholders. These two issues even become more critical. So there are three things that we think that companies can be doing today to try to address these issues, but also to prepare for driving differentiation after the crisis. And Adam, I'm just going to, to go through those uh, quickly here. If you go to the next page, the first one's going to be making sure that we're taking the opportunity to uh, do uh, a b testing and understand what's actually driving return so most companies with their digital marketing complain that they don't actually know what's having a, a financial impact when you have to do everything digitally it's the perfect moment for experimentation because all of a sudden you're forced into doing what before you might not have been willing to do the second item that we would suggest would be specifically um, on the next page to understand it, it broaden the capabilities across your team for engaging digitally one of the biggest issues is that digital creating good digital content requires a broad team effort across different functional areas from uh, 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 medical affairs to market access but not all those functional areas have the right capabilities right now when many of them are at home unable to engage uh, uh, external stakeholders it's the perfect moment to invest in those capabilities internally. And then finally, uh, on the third item here, the, the question of uh, content management. A content management to create differentiated content, make sure we're getting the right message at the right time, actually driving differentia differentiation requires making sure that we have the right content available and pushing it out to the right stakeholders. And I think, again, this is a key moment to make sure that we're actually building up that content and building up the right content and using this spare capacity that we have with people that might not be engaging externally uh, to build up the messaging uh, content for use after the crisis. And um, I'm gonna stop here, in fact, as we're at right at the top of the hour, um, but those are the three key messages that I wanna provide to, to our listeners this evening. I think these are gonna be key, not only for today, but also for what comes next. Um, as we know, we're going to go back to more of a mix between in-person and digital, 
uh, but still, uh, what's going to drive the differentiation? And for me, it's going to be excelling in, in these three buckets. Thanks, Alec. Uh, great insights there from you and Adam. I know we're just at the top of the hour, but we've had a few questions come through. So if those of you on the line wouldn't mind staying a, a few minutes, um, we'd like to have a few questions uh, out to, to the group here. Um, if there are any other questions that you guys have on the line, um, you can share them uh, via GoToMeeting Messenger uh, and send your questions to Ducker Frontier Webinars. Any that we don't get to today, we'll be happy to answer later. Um, so maybe just one question here uh, for you, Alex, sticking with the digital theme. Um, do you see any other industry that is doing digital engagement exceptionally well? Um, and can you explain a little bit? If so, why? Yeah, no, it's a, it's an excellent question and one that I actually get quite a bit. So uh, when I've talked to other industries, whether it be uh, uh, industrials, manufacturing, B2C, they actually all struggle with the same issue. How do I measure ROI? How do I create the right content, give the right uh, people at the right time? The companies that do the best at this and that always raise their hand and say, hey, we excel, I have no problems, um, are the digital native companies. And so here I'm talking about big tech. And why do they say they excel? Because they can effectively track their stakeholders, their consumers, their users, um, their decision makers across the whole customer life cycle. So from when they enter their platform to when they exit. So they know when to engage, how to engage, what material is needed. Um, and that's an interesting perspective because right now I would say that with the expansion of telehealth, with the expansion of essentially more of your stakeholders engaging via digital platforms and exchanging information while they're obviously critical question marks around how that data is used, stored and shared, um, that's gonna start opening up new opportunities to understand exactly what are the critical moments, what are the critical needs, and follow those stakeholders more closely. Thanks, Alec. Uh, extremely great insights there. Uh, unfortunately, we're at the end of our time today. We're already a little bit over. Um, as I mentioned, any of the questions uh, that are coming through that we don't get to today, uh, we're happy to follow up with those or please reach out to your relationship manager. Um, before we, we finally conclude, maybe um, Alec or Adam, any, any final remarks to share? Sure. So I'll run through uh, some key takeaways. Um, first of all, Asia is confronting a second wave of COVID-19 infections and a deepening global recession that will batter its populations and severely weaken public finances. Um, as a result, healthcare executives are confronting significant uncertainty around demand planning, uh, supply chains, engagement models, strategic planning, uh, and these challenges, uh, regrettably, and the uncertainty uh, that is involved will likely extend through the end of this year at a minimum. Uh, COVID-19 will have a long-lasting impact on the healthcare agendas of governments across developed and emerging Asia in a variety of ways. Uh, market access and reimbursement, uh, localization pressures, e-health implementation, and really overarching healthcare reform. And so with this in mind, healthcare companies should try to shape how the post-pandemic world will look. Um, ideally, uh, they should use a holistic scenario planning approach, strong stakeholder management, and uh, flawless communication strategy. Great. Thank you, Adam, for rounding out our session today. Um, for everyone on the line, that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to speaking with all, all of you again soon. Take care. Stay safe.